of the hired slaves. As this historical vignette shows, by this stage in the history of Cape Town, there was already a sharp distinction between the way the elite of society and its underclass interacted with Table Mountain. For the privileged, the mountain was a place of leisure, of picnics, of wildflower picking, while for the poor, it was a place of backbreaking toil to which they went only to chop wood or act as porters for the pleasure seekers. However, in the pre-colonial era, the relationship which the indigenous people at the Cape had with the Table Mountain chain, uh, defined as from Signal Hill to Cape Point, was very different. The Khoi who lived in the Table Valley gathered shellfish at the coast, hunted and gathered, the gathered roots, wild fruits and nuts on Table Mountain for consumption and for use in traditional medicine. The roots and the fruits gathered on the mountain, particularly wild or bitter almonds, were used as food and was particularly important in winter when the roots of the wild almond tree formed an important part of their diet. Groups of semi-nomadic herders who lived beyond the Hottentot Holland Mountains trekked to the Table Valley every year in order to pasture their cattle and establish their encampments in the foothills and the forests of Table Mountain. In addition to the subsistence use of the mountain, it was also used as a place of refuge and escape during times of conflict among the Khoi groups. From the late 15th century and over the next century and a half, the close interaction the indigenous people had with the mountain continued largely uninterrupted during the many visits by European traders who called at the Cape on their way to Southeast Asia in order to take on fresh water and barter for cattle with the local inhabitants. Contact was mostly peaceful, but the mountain also provided the native people with a means of escape when conflict occurred with the Europeans such as one incident when the Khoi defended their watering place from Vasco da Gama's men in December 1497. The Khoi were intimately familiar with the Table Mountain chain and its natural resources, but they interacted with it for subsistence purposes, and it is doubtful that the mountain chain was used by the indigenous people for any other reason besides survival. The likelihood, therefore, is that the leisure use of the mountains was an activity which began only from the era of European exploration onwards. The Table Mountain chain has attracted climbers right from the early years of European exploration, such as when Antonio de Saldana in 1503 climbed it to get the lie of the land, or spot any cattle for which they could barter. For weary sailors on their way to the East Indies, who had been confined to cramped conditions on board tiny ships for months on end, the ascent of Table Mountain via Platyclip Gorge offered a means of healthy exercise and recreation. From 1652 onwards, the unhindered access of the Khoi to their traditional land in and around the Table Valley was gradually but inevitably curtailed as the settlement expanded and settlers encroached upon their land. This was starkly demonstrated in 1657, when the commander of the settlement, Jan van Riebeck, went to the eastern side of Table Mountain to decide on land, which would be allocated to the free men, the free burghers, for farming purposes. He found a Khoi encampment on the very land he had decided upon. But when the Khoi objected to their plans, he dismissed their concerns, claiming that, and I quote, there was everywhere enough grazing for the animals, unquote. Conflict was inevitable, and war between the two groups followed in 1660, a war which, given their superior weapons, was naturally won by the Dutch. And I've included a very revealing comment um, by the Khoi, written in Van Riebeck's diary. So within eight years of Dutch settlement, the native people lost the Table Valley and with it unrestricted access to their traditional grazing and encampment grounds on Table Mountain. 
the koi now had to ask for permission to gather the roots and the bitter almonds they needed as winter food on Table Mountain. The bitter irony of their loss was revealed when permission was refused for strategic and defensive reasons by the settlers. The remnants of Van Riebeek's hedge, as the defensive hedge came to be known, are still to be seen at Kirstenbosch today. The 18th century saw the beginning of the leisure use of Table Mountain by the social and the governing elite. For them, the mountain had become a place of sumptuous picnics, while for visiting botanists and naturalists, Table Mountain had become, in the words of environmental historian Lance van Sittert, a site of scientific and romantic pilgrimage. For the underclasses, however, the mountain was primarily a place of work. So the experienced mountaineers in the 18th century were the servants and the slaves, since they knew the mountain intimately as a result of their daily chores. In the early 19th century, horse rides and picnicking on the lower slopes of the mountain where carriages could reach were also popular pastimes among the upper classes. Meanwhile, the poor continued to act as guides and porters for pleasure seekers as well as scientists and to wash laundry in the streams. By the mid to late 19th century, walks to the summit of Table Mountain via Plutterclip Gorge or on horseback via the newly constructed bridle path on, on Constantia Nick began to emerge as a regular leisure pursuit among the elite. They were often accompanied by porters and servants to serve a champagne tiffin on the summit. During the late 1880s, the picking of wildflowers from, the, from Table Mountain for sale on the streets of Cape Town, a, a survival strategy of the poor, emerged. However, this practice came under attack with restrictive legislation ostensibly aimed at conserving indigenous flowers, but in practice attacking the poor for denuding the mountain. The historical interaction of people with Table Mountain was thus determined by their race and their class. So whites used the mountain for pleasure, while blacks either enabled this enjoyment or used the mountain for survival purposes. However, um, there was one exception to the strict division of activities, namely the mountain excursions undertaken by the black pupils of Zonnebloom College from the mid-19th century onwards. The college, which had been established on the slopes of Table Mountain by the Anglican Church, this is where Warmer Estate is now, um, was intended to educate the children of African chiefs. The pupils of the college went on regular mountain excursions accompanied by their teachers. As an integral part of their school program, as well as during their leisure hours, this was the first recorded example that I was able to find of the recreational use of Table Mountain by black people during the colonial era. And this is a picture taken during the late um, 19th century of some of the students at Zonnebloom College. Moving to the next era, which is the late colonial era, the late 1880s to 1909, that was just um, on the verge of South Africa being uh, declared united. So that would have been the end of the colonial era. During this particular period, there was equality before the law in the Cape Colony, and the non-racial franchise granted the vote to all males who qualified. But in reality, Cape society was highly stratified, and stratified along racial and class lines. And social segregation above the level of the working class was widely practiced. Inevitably, sport reflected the contemporary political context of white dominance and black subordination, as well as the pattern of social segregation in society. Thus, exclusively white sports clubs were established, and black people keen on sport had little option 
but to form their own clubs. But segregation in sport went further, as separate sport clubs were formed among black communities as well. And Africans, Indians, Cape Muslims, known then as Cape Malays, and coloreds formed their own clubs as well. However, at this stage, the separation was generally not hostile or rigid, and teams formed by one particular group could and often did include members of other groups. Climbing to the summit of Table Mountain became a popular leisure activity by the mid to late 19th century, but most confined themselves to the three or four easy routes to the top, Platterclip Gorge being one of the most popular. It was only when experienced alpine climbers from Britain and Europe arrived at the Cape after the 1880s that the sport of rock and face climbing became established. This is a picture of alpine climbers, probably somewhere in Europe. We'll move on now to um, the establishment of mountaineering as a formal sport in South Africa. Um, the Mountain Club, which was established in Cape Town in October 1891, arose from the need for a mountain search and rescue service. The leaders and the members of the newly formed club formed a veritable who's who of the professional and governing elite of Cape Town. An indication of the social standing and the powerful position that the club would attain was demonstrated by the fact that over time, three prime ministers, including Cecil John Rhodes and General Jan Smuts, would join the club. The newly established Mountain Club was quick to use its political clout, raising concerns over the prevention of public access to Table Mountain by private landowners in Parliament. Looking at the politics of exclusion, I look first at the um, gender, issue of gender. Women were not allowed to be members of the Mountain Club at first, only honorary members. Although this prohibition did not last long due to the protests of keen female mountaineers. The original prohibition was undoubtedly due to the fact that during the Victorian era, the, no the notion of passive femininity held sway. And there was a widespread perception that, given their childbearing function, sport in general and strenuous activities in particular were unsuitable physical activities for women. Hence, many alpine clubs abroad banned women from membership although this did not stop women in Europe and the USA from achieving fearless feats of mountaineering. Despite the generally encouraging attitude towards women climbers in society and in the MCSA, there were many, like Editha Ball Mills, who developed into accomplished rock climbers. This is a picture of some, I think taken at the turn of the century, of some of the fearless female mountain climbers at the time. How they climbed in those skirts, I'm not quite sure. Um, and, and these women climbers encouraged each other, urging women to try mountaineering, described in the club's journal by one of these very female rock climbers as, I quote, an inestimable and incomparable boon to physical and mental health, unquote. The politics of exclusion also extended to race, and the MCSA also excluded people on the basis of race, despite the fact that its constitution did not contain a racial bar. Notwithstanding, the notion of black members was unthinkable, given the unwritten traditional color bar in society in general. It was easy to exclude blacks from the club, given their subordinate position in society. This stereotyped blacks in this position and meant that they would only be viewed as mountain guides and porters to the public, in which role the MCSA acted as registration agent and supervisor. 
then exclusion on the basis of religion and ethnicity. In similar vein, Jews were also not welcome in the club, although this too was an unwritten rule. The attitude of the club was rooted in the prejudice and the negative stereotypes about Jews in society um, which prevailed at the time. They were often portrayed as, I quote, unassimilable, unquote, aliens, as undesirable immigrants with insanitary habits and as a threat to Cape Town's mercantile class. Moving to the next era, which is now post-Union, looking at the first decades of the post-Union era. <clears throat> the political unification of the country in 1910 came at the expense of black South Africans, whose hopes for the extension of the non-racial Cape franchise for men were dashed. This signaled the beginning of relentless restrictions on the land and franchise rights of black South Africans, as well as the extension of racial segregation and institutionalized racial discrimination in the post-Union era. In sport and politics, the ethnic sectarianism which had begun to creep into the black sporting sector during the late 19th century now became more widespread. In the Cape, where an aggressive colored exclusivism, which was openly hostile to Africans and Muslims, took root. The black, sector now the black sporting sector now became increasingly inflexible, and certain colored clubs barred Muslims and Africans from membership in their constitutions. The Mountain Club of South Africa, the pattern set by the club of close interaction with the socio-political establishment continued, with invitations to leading figures to attend its annual dinners. This was also demonstrated by its collaboration in 1914 with the South African Railways on a tourism brochure, focusing on the sport of mountaineering in South Africa. This is the cover of the um, publication in 1914, which I think was pretty forward thinking for 1914. Another indication of the MCSA's close identification with the ideology of the governing class was demonstrated during speeches at the 1912 and 1913 annual dinners, which portrayed blacks as barbarians and, and portrayed whites as bringing civilization to South Africa. It also highlighted, the speeches also highlighted the political role that the club could play in healing the divisions which the Second Anglo Boer War, 1899 to 1902, had caused between white English and Afrikaans speakers. The fact that the MCSA was deeply embedded with the educated and affluent sector of society meant that it could only and would only identify with and reflect the interests of that sector. This was reflected in its sympathetic approach to the issue of wildflower picking by the white public and charitable organizations which picked and sold huge numbers of wildflowers for the war effort. This is World War I, of course. The club was reluctant with what it saw, to interfere with what it saw as the public's right to pick wildflowers and recommended education as a way forward. But at the same time, they recommended punitive action against colored wildflower pickers, not education. The portrayal of blacks in the pages of the club's journal was also problematic. In the rural areas of the Western Cape, most of the porters the club hired were farm workers who were usually completely inexperienced climbers. Nevertheless, they were often expected to undertake rope climbing on precipitous routes. And articles in the Cape's journal conveyed a consistent picture of blacks as reluctant mountaineers, terrified of heights, fearful of being attacked by wild animals, and unhappy with sleeping in the open. <clears throat> 
The club's journal articles often referred to the gulf in the perception of mountaineering between whites and blacks, with whites usually portrayed as perceiving mountaineering as a healthy, enjoyable, and even spiritual pursuit, while blacks who had a more pragmatic relationship with the mountains were portrayed as unable to comprehend this abstract approach. These portrayals in the journal served to reinforce the prevailing perception of mountaineering as the domain of whites and as a leisure pursuit which could not be understood and therefore enjoyed by blacks. Um, this extract from a speech by um, Smuts sums up his philosophy, which had a very spiritual and um, religious dimension towards mountains and mountaineering. At best, the language used in the club's minutes and in the pages of its journal also served to other blacks and perpetuate their subordinate role, with the use of master-servant terms such as bass being used in the journal. At worst, the language was derogatory, with extremely racially offensive terms being used, as in this extract that I included over there. This was in the joint SAR MCSA brochure on tourism and mountaineering. For the most part, however, the language used in club publications was not extreme, but paternalistic. It was a kind of casual racism which took for granted the subordinate role of blacks, routinely referring to grown men as boys, colored boys, Cape boys, Zulu boys, native carriers, while terms which reflected the master-servant relationship prevailed during this period, such as Bas, which summed up the elitism and the casual racism which underlay the ordered, comfortable world of the MCSA member at the time. The problem was that the long-term consequence of this type of language would be to entrench and perpetuate the subordinate image of blacks in future years and would make it extremely difficult for the MCSA to relate to blacks on any level of equality. What of the position of women in climbing at this time? Now, women continued to participate in very challenging climbs, but despite this, the, M the women in the MCSA still had to navigate paternalistic attitudes and sexism, which held that they should not go on climbs, nor should they lead, uh, so they should not lead on climbs, sorry, and they should not go on women-only ex expeditions if they thought they could escape the the not leading issue by going on women-only expeditions, that was also frowned upon. So the image of mountaineering projected by the club was very much a masculine one. And the focus of recruitment of the next generation, the youth, was on the schoolboy, described as the mountaineer in embryo. Society's focus on women mountaineers was still rather superficial, often choosing to center on what they wore on how rather than on how they climbed. Even expert female climbers were often subject to, to bias, regarded as not having good leadership skills or a sense of direction. We still have to put up with that today. Uh, not having a good sense of direction equal to that of a man. And most annoying of all was the undermining of women climbers who had conquered climbs thought to be, to be the preserve of only expert male climbers a few years before. The implied message was clear. If a woman could do it, then the route was immediately downgraded to one of little significance or status. <laughs> what of the position of Jews in the MCSA at this time? Well, in society, the pattern of bigotry towards Jews continued in the early 20th century fueled by the economic recession and the acute xenophobia which followed the immigration of thousands of Eastern Europeans, mostly Jews, into South Africa. By the 1920s, the pre prevailing image of Jews 
in South Africa had become, in the words of historian Milton Shane, overwhelmingly negative. Given this context, it is not surprising to learn that when the issue of the lack of Jewish members was timidly raised by a member in 1929, it was simply quashed by the committee. Then I came upon um, a, the South African College Schools Mountain Club, which I decided to include because of their close connection with the MCSA. This was established way back in 1919 at SACS, which was and probably remains an expensive private school. In 1828, only for white boys. But then later during the 19th century, it opened its doors to those who could afford its fees. And students of color, such as Dr. Abdurrahman, this is a picture of Dr. Abdurrahman, um, were admitted. Abdurrahman matriculated at SACS sometime in the late 1880s and went on to study medicine in um, Scotland because he was, uh, students of color were not allowed to study at UCT at that time and for many years afterwards. Subsequently, he became a prominent local politician and a member of the Cape Town City Council. It's of interest to note that um, Dr. Abdurman would later have a connection to mountaineering. He was instrumental in assisting the Cape Province Mountain Club to attain its um, club hut on the summit of Table Mountain. After um, 1905 and the passing of the Cape School Board Act, however, students of color were excluded from sex, I believe, until 1990 or thereabouts, possibly earlier. I speak under correction there. Um, the establishment of the club had, as I said earlier, a, um, a connection with uh, the MCSA, and it had its roots in a tradition of school-going mountaineering. Um, the club's first committee included the two sons of Dr. Marlis, who was the founder of the MCSA in 1891. The club also received regular training from the MCSA. I'd now like to introduce um, a different topic, um, part of the same theme and story though, leisure mountaineering and the sport of mountain climbing among blacks, the first half of the 20th century, what I would call part of the hidden history of mountaineering in Cape Town. Now rock climbing was obviously slow to take off among black communities because they were unable to acquire the necessary skills. They couldn't afford the expense of specialized gear, nor could they um, be part of the mountain club. However, the regular recreational use of the mountains began when the youth of those um, communities, with easy access to the mountain, who were often confined to narrow streets with few outdoor recreation facilities, used the mountain as a leisure space. These communities included small colored enclaves in white um, areas, uh, such as Sea Point um, and Newlands, um, and also predominantly colored areas from the Boer Cup all the way around to Simonstown. By the late 1920s, um, there was a significant increase in the number of black, mainly colored mountaineers, or people using um, the mountains for, for leisure by the 19, late 1920s. And this was actually commented on by the MCSA in their minutes. The community of District 6, situated at the foot of Table Mountain, was a particularly important nursery of mountaineering talent. One of the reasons for this was that there were a number of organizations, such as the Marion Institute, the Silver Trees Boys Club, and several scout troops, which gave youngsters their first taste of the outdoors and mountain-based leisure activities. The community, sorry, some District 6 youngsters such as Dirk Seafogel, this is Dirk, and I've included his, his picture, this was taken in the 1950s, because he went on to found a, a family mountaineering dynasty. His children and grandchildren, and I hope great-grandchildren, are keen mountaineers today. 
um, and they joined the Cape Province Mountain Club. Um, they had their interest in mountaineering sparked by the Cowley Brothers, a group of Anglican missionaries based in District 6. Other young mountaineers who were mentored by scout masters during this period included Erwin Combrink and Terence um, Fredericks, who both went on to become um, uh, doctors and heritage activists. They both sat on the board of the District 6 Museum, as did Vincent Colby, who was also on the board. He was a librarian. And Richard Reeve, who I'm sure many of you know as a novelist. What you may not know is that he was a keen mountaineer himself, not a rock climber, but certainly a keen mountaineer. Now, an important question that might be occurring to you right now is why were these black mountaineering, um, these black mountaineers mainly colored? An important factor, of course, was their residential proximity to the mountain. Another was the exclusion of Africans from urban areas and their forced removal to African locations from the early years of the 20th century. Um, I noticed there was an advert for a talk by um, Dr. Howard Phillips on the bubonic plague. That was one of the justifications used to remove um, Africans from District 6, where they also lived. So, you know, this story might have been very different today, but for the forced removals of Africans already from the early 20th century onwards. And this continued throughout the first half of the 20th century. Africans were removed either through for so-called medical reasons or for exclusionary measures such as influx control and also the implementation of the colored labor preference policy. So Africans were at the bottom of an artificially created racial hierarchy of privilege leaving colored people relatively better off. And the only references I've really been able to find um, of Africans during this, of African recreation seekers during this pe uh, period was a very fleeting reference to um, an African location in Camps Bay. If anybody has any information on that, I would be most grateful. And of course, Luyolo Township, which um, where, where people lived for, for many years until the 1960s. And because of the location of Luyolo on um, the mountain slope outside uh, Simonstown, they, undoubtedly they would have used the mountain for recreation. Unfortunately, there's very little um, information about this community and the way in which they use the mountain. Hopefully that will be um, you know, sorted out in, in years to come by other historians. The next political era that I'd like to look at is the segregation era from the 1930s to the 1940s. Now the de facto racial segregation of earlier years now became increasingly institutionalized and the pattern of political and economic inequality of all blacks but especially Africans became entrenched. Social segregation in pre-apartheid Cape Town during the 1940s was extensive, whether enshrined in law or not. In the voluntary or private se sector, uh, private interest sector, racially discriminatory practices were common. Thus, organ private organizations such as the Felt Trust, which was a soil conservation body, had a constitutional bar to black membership. Separate sports clubs for Africans, coloreds, Malays, Indians had now become the norm. Black sports clubs themselves voluntarily and actively enforced these artificial lines of separation. In fact, anti-Muslim discrimination became so serious during the 30s and the 40s that many Muslim sports persons had to either pretend to be Christian in order to be accepted by colored clubs, or they had to start their own clubs. And I have some family experience of this as my father and uh, friends, uh, older friends of his had to start a tennis club in Salt River where they lived for that exact reason. Um, the mountain clubs. And the first one that I'm going to deal with is the Cape Province Mountain Club. <clears throat> 
Um, and as we've seen, there was a growing popularity among the colored community. So it's not surprising that this was established in about mid-1931 by District 6 uh, residents. And they approached the MCSA for assistance in starting their club. This is the, one of the earliest pictures of the founders of the club. Carl Fisher, Cecil Townsend. Um, Fisher and Townsend worked for the council as mountain rangers. Um, so basically the club had a lower middle class and working class um, membership. During the war years, there was very little activity and the club was kept going by Ronald February. Uh, February sisters, Frida, Lily, Joan, and Georgina, who all worked, uh, sorry, who all lived in the Boer Cup. And I've mentioned them by name because they are the early forerunners of a very famous mountaineering dynasty. Many of you will know of Ed February. Those were his aunts. Um, <clears throat> And then another prominent member was Charlie, Charlie Hankey. Um, however, sorry, I just wanted to mention that the picture that we have here is of Cecil Townsend. It's rather sad because uh, he ended his life as a hermit. Today we would call him a vagrant, but he played the violin in the, in, in, in the cave and read his books. So definitely no vagrant. Ended his life as a hermit uh, in a cave on Table Mountain. Now, in terms of the composition of the CPMC, um, the club has maintained that it is non-racial. Um, and I think from this point of view, you know, we would all like to accept that. But, you know, given the rampant ethnic and religious sectarianism in black sports clubs that I've just outlined during the 30s and the 40s, it is likely that the club would have been colored and Christian at that time. The University of Cape Town Mountain and Ski Club was established in 1933 at UCT, of course, and its composition would have been very similar to that of um, the MCSA. There was no question of uh, black students becoming part of the club, and they consequently kept themselves to themselves. So even a highly um, experienced mountain climber like Erwin Combrink would not have been accepted by the club. The club was well resourced as it received funding from the university administration to cover the costs of transport, the purchase of camping, climbing and skiing equipment, tools, material for hut repair and maintenance work, and even to pay for the cost of a new hut. The position of women. At the time, there were two prevailing attitudes. Some, like Eddie Pels in the UCT MSC, supported women. Others, like Martin Fesfeld, held that women were only good for washing plates. However, many female members of the, of the UCT MSC were extremely capable climbers, and just one of them was Elsie Esterhazen, the botanist who held dual membership with the MCSA. And she also went on uh, women-only climbs, an intrepid and fearless climber. The Mountain Club. The elite status and position of the club was unchanged during this period. Um, and it was able to continue to call upon members of the governing class. Blacks continued to be excluded from the club, except in the role of cleaners, of course. So any relationship of equality between the MCSA and the MCSA was just not possible. The club was not only concerned to exclude blacks, it was also concerned to exclude blacks from its facilities. And so in 1947, one of the committee members voiced his disquiet about one of the guests who was perceived to be not strictly European. Not quite sure what that meant. Um, women and mountaineering in the MCSA. So despite many decades of female participation in mountaineering and serious rock climbing, 
women continued to be undermined. And again, people focused on suitable attire. And in one article in the newspaper, girls were advised to steer clear of shaped shorts and a tight shirt, but they were not to look a sight and they were not to just casually don anything that is hard wearing. Instead, they should remember that a woman's duty is to look attractive always. So they're to look attractive, but not too attractive. Meanwhile, others like Florence Humphreys um, just carried on with their mountaineering um, career, and Florence Humphreys was in fact awarded the gold badge in 1936. And then what else did I want to say about that? Oh yes, this was an article uh, in the journal in 1937, just to balance out, just to show you that there were male members of the club who were in support of female climbers. Um, right, uh, let's go on. Jews in the MCSA. Now, this was a really bad period for Jews in South Africa. It was the height of organized anti-Semitism, signaled by the passing of the Immigration Quota Act, which restricted immigration from Eastern European countries, and they were mainly Jews. Um, and the government, um, its motivation was for the, for the law was to maintain Western civilization and to deal with, and I quote, an undigested, unabsorbed, and unabsorbable minority. That was, that, that was his words about, those were its words about Jews. Then in 1933, South Africa's own Nazi party was established by this um, gentleman here, Louis Theodore Weichart in 1933. Um, and this is a picture of the gray shirts. So it was really an ugly period for anti-Semitic discourse in South Africa. Um, and still, the Mountain Club refused to admit Jews to the club. The first club member was admitted in 1947. It was after the war. Claude Katz, a very forgiving person. Um, Interaction among the Cape Town-based clubs, as, we, as is fairly obvious, the MCSA's relationship with the CPMC was fairly cordial, but paternalistic, which meant that unequal power relations between the two clubs um, was inevitable. In fact, the club seemed to perceive the, the CPMC mainly as a mechanism for handling the increasing number of non-Europeans on Table Mountain, in quotes. This aloof relationship also stretched to the two clubs in formal search and rescue activities. It was not prepared to formalize this, nor was it prepared to mentor the juniors in the CPMC. So the result of this is that the CPMC was deprived of the opportunity to gain further rock climbing expertise and the juniors were deprived of the opportunity to be mentored by the MCSA. In complete contrast, however, the two white clubs, as they were at that time, uh, enjoyed close interaction, cordiality, joint meet, reciprocal rights, and so forth. Then just as an interesting aside, the Bergen Tour Club at the University of Stellenbosch, strictly speaking, not part of, of Cape Town, but I thought it was interesting to include this um, because they had a very close relationship with UCT MSC at the time. And you know, it is doubtful that any interaction would have taken place between the UCT club if they actually had been open, uh, because there is, there is uh, you know, I, I seriously doubt whether the Bergen Tour Club would have interact with them, interacted with them if they had been um, integrated. So then in summary, in terms of the interaction of the, white, of the two white mountain clubs, this was based on their perception of their members as social and economic and political equals. So their relationship was based on equality and collegiality. In contrast with this, the relationship with the MCSA and the CPMC was rooted in the former's perception of itself
as a white organization, catering only for the elite of society. So within this framework, there was no place for the burgeoning numbers of black, predominantly colored mountaineers. In conclusion then, this lecture has sought to show that since the first recorded instances of the non-subsistence use of the table mountain chain, the nature of leisure interaction with the mountain has been governed by the overlapping factors of race and class. This was inevitable in a colonial society in which the notion of white domination and black subordination provided its sociopolitical and economic foundation. By the early 20th century, when racial segregation and discrimination was fast becoming the norm in society, exclusion based on race and ethnicity had also become entrenched in the sphere of sport in general, and the world of mountaineering in particular. It was thus entirely predictable that mountain clubs in Cape Town would reflect the divisions of a society stratified by race, class, ethnicity, and religion. Hence, the MCSA and UCTMSC reflected the political ideology of the elite, which took for granted white superiority and black inferiority. While the CPMC not only reflected the white, sorry, the ethnic sectarianism within the black community, but it was also forced to shoulder the burden of socioeconomic discrimination and the impact of racial inequality on their chosen sport. Thus, all three clubs may be said to have been products of their era, with the political realities of the day strongly impacting upon and to a large extent dictating their relationships with each other in ways which would ultimately distort and retard the development of mountaineering in Cape Town. Since the emergence of the formal sport of mountaineering in the late 19th century, the sport was effectively set on a path which was strongly influenced and shaped by the politics of the period, and which would be consolidated and perpetuated by the apartheid era which followed, as we shall see in tomorrow's talk. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, if there are any comments and questions, I would be happy to engage. Yes. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I have one question and two comments. Firstly, the question. You made no mention of the Western Province Mountain Club. Perhaps you might have a few words, please. Um, that's because uh, you came a bit late, so you didn't see that my talk ended at the end of the 1940s and the Western Province Mountain Club only started in 1967. So I will definitely be dealing with them tomorrow. So if I could leave that for tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, when it comes to gender discrimination, this was the feature of all the mountaineering clubs in England. Yeah. In the, before the Kaiser's War. And it's interesting that although they ladies attended meets. Some ladies formed their own club, the Pinnacle mm -hmm. Club. Yes. And the York Francis Club then had to wait a hundred females had to wait a hundred years before they got membership. Sure. Unbelievable. And finally the attitude to Jews here was just the same as in England. Sorry, it was just the attitude to Jews, the Jewish membership was just the same as Mountain Club here as it was in the clubs in England. Interesting. Thank you very much for those two comments. Yes, um, I did say in my uh, introduction on, on, on the issue of gender that the MCSA probably took their cue from the Alpine Mining Clubs, which from the outset excluded women. Um, but they very soon learned the error of their ways. I imagine their partners and their wives and their daughters were having no truck with that. So they only had to wait a year for membership and then three years for full and, and, and all privileges.
Um, and in terms of the, um, uh, the anti-Semitism, yes, it's a universal um, problem. It's not something which only happened in South Africa. It's an ugly um, tray and phenomenon, which you are quite correct, manifested itself in many countries all over the world. But I wasn't aware that other mountain clubs also excluded Jews. Um, if you can give me some um, references for that, I'd be most grateful. Thank you. Um, middle. I'd love to get that and, reference as well. Uh, also, I've been working with Moses McPhee, as you've been a Katani, mm. who was a resident of, of, of the success. And he's got the other thing of quite a lot. So, in so, uh, many ways, they were represented an entire generation mm. of people at that time. A, a very poorly working class uh, 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 person from the success who went to started off working in a factory, went on to become a teacher, and then while being a teacher, studied to be a medical doctor. And uh, throughout that period, he's always been a little activist, and, uh, and yeah, so he was really uh, mm. instrumental in, a, in that period. And of course, it, it was also common, uh, something that my generation much later on would uh, use, is to use hiking as a political Thing. In the you in the, the organizations of the six often organize these walks up up that mountain, be it the the Communist Party, the early African National Congress, the, the non-European the community movement, mm. and that tactic would be used by activists in the eighties. Very important to show in the I, I, I think that you probably won't touch on it tomorrow. Famous Chinook uh, uh, Lotus got buried in on the mountain in the United States. And uh, many people chose to actually do things like that mm. on the mountain. Yeah. Uh, because it was free of, of, of racism. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm. Of oh, that race. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes, uh, Owen Combrink was a, a political activist, and I have in fact come across references. Um, where he uh, describes how he took students and um, exposed them to politics on, on, on the mountain as well. Um, others were Frank van der Horst and Lionel van der Horst and also um, George Rudolph, all um, radical uh, po political activists of the 30s and the 40s and, and the 50s. Um, and many of them were teachers Many of them were members of the unity movement. Others were members of more radical organizations. Um, and yes, they would use a Table Mountain as an escape, as a quiet place to politicize the next generation of youth. So yes, thank you very much. I will be touching on some of that tomorrow. But it would be great if you could fill in the gaps. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>